This car's a piece of shit. Ah, uh, the super beater. One of my favorite cars that we have driven and thrashed. This is in fact a Hemi Orange 70 Super B. 383 car, don't confuse the Hemi with the orange, that's the color of the car. But uh, this car has definitely seen better days. And both Mike and I, which this is Mike's car, we are going to get this thing ready for mats and duct tape drags this year. Yeah, you probably see my thumb. I smashed the crap out of it. So, you know, homemade duct tape repair. Um, back to the B, this car will be race ready for both mats and duct tape drags 2024. This engine is coming out. Yeah, damaged thumb up. Good thumb gonna go back in by the time this is healed. It is going to be beefed up with a faux Fodi Magnum with more camshaft, more intake, more heads, more headers. This thing is going to haul ass. And of course, this is the lightweight model as you have seen. Although that we do need to take care of along with the other side. That is actually the leaf spring coming through the trunk pan. That's part of the frame rail attached to the leaf spring that is now Look, yep, <laughs> that is a no buenos. <laughs> Quite a few of you guys were thinking, how dare you guys thrash, jump and destroy a 70 Supi? You guys are pieces of crap. We are not harming the car in any way that it isn't already foobarred up. The frame rails, <laughs> we're not gonna make them any worse. They're already junk. The whole back half of this car would have to get cut off and replaced. The front half of this car would have to get cut off and replaced. The middle part of this car would have to get cut off and replaced. This car is a piece of shit. As soon as the sun comes up here in a minute, we're going to hook a strap to this thing. And it is going to go all the way over here to the Aspen. Yep, this is a beater car that I paid $600 for out of a junkyard. Fixed it up a little bit on the low key, low budget, and this thing is now a badass little beater. V8 rear wheel drive cars that are beaters are amazingly fun. And they sound good too. All right, 
Let's get this hood off here. This is a racing liftoff hood. Oh, it still has my gas can. Ooh, wee, that is razor sharp there. No fan shroud, no nothing. And this is a 383. It's not the number 383, I don't think. Regardless, this is not the engine we're going to be using. This is going to be yanked out and saved for later. I'm gonna go ahead and start tearing into the donor 440 because that one is not exactly ready to go in. Why so serious, Bolt? This is supposed to be a fun time. Because we've got 440 right here. Let's go ahead and open this thing up. I know this motor. I pulled this motor out of the Roadrunner that it was in. I've never driven that Roadrunner, but Mike says that uh, last time he drove this thing, he thinks he spun a rod bearing and he started hearing uh, some clickety clatter or some knockety tick tapping. But yeah, this is out of what we call puddles because this thing would leave a puddle wherever it was at. And the reason it would leave a puddle, <laughs> whoever did the machine work on this engine didn't line bore it correctly. And so the crankshaft in this 440 sits crooked. Yep, it doesn't sit perfectly true to the block and it kills seals. It's had like three seals put in it. It's had three different uh, seal caps and even an aftermarket one. And you can see where the crankshaft wears into the actual seal cap. So this engine is officially junk for any streetcar. The block is junk, but it's good enough for a jalopy race car. This is the point where Mike thought there was a failure. So I need to check every single rod and make sure the bearings are good on this thing and check the main bearings too. But this motor is actually really nice. It's got ARP rod bolts in it. You can tell all the pistons were weight matched. So were the rods. It's got little dome pistons in it. This Super B is gonna fly. <laughs> but I need to pull, so I'm gonna go ahead down the row and check every single one of these. And if I find the problem child, that's when I'll have to figure out what to do. Is the crank need turned? Are we just gonna throw a bearing at it? What size bearing do I need? One by one, check it out. As we're setting it down, or getting ready to set it down on the jack stands, I wonder if the uh, frame rail is going to fall back in place. <laughs> Let's see. It's through the floor. Alright, go ahead, Derek. Ugh. Not quite. Still going to have to fix that. I've never been under this car. Man, this thing's a piece of shit. <laughs> Look at this thing. Torsion support, rockers. Well, the floor is obviously everywhere. The rear frame rails, the inner outer wheel wells, the quarters, I mean, anything within eye shot is foobard. The front frame rails are rotted. That's a 1968 drive shaft. This is a 1970. So, this car is El Junco. It makes it a perfect candidate for the Jalopy Autocross. Bad news, but good news. We're actually going to pull the engine and transmission out of this thing. We're not going to use the transmission because the engine is locked up. I don't know how the engine locked up. I mean, it's a mystery. Send them bald eagles flying! Yeah! Oh shit! <laughs> But it is, and so I can't get the converter bolts. And so with that problem, I went on Marketplace and it just so happened to be a reverse manual valve body 727 big block transmission with a 2500 stall converter. Cheap, like 700 bucks. So 
I'm not even gonna bother with this stock crap. We're gonna go get the good stuff. But I need to reinforce this car, make the brakes function, make the steering function, make some kind of electrical function, make the cooling system function. There is a crap load of stuff to do. Holy crap, that's paper thin. Holy crap, everything on this car is clapped out or broken. Look at this tie rod. <laughs> Look, a tire had exploded at one point and killed the firewall right there, which also hurt the frame rail. Yep, and well, no, the inner fender's there, but yeah, it just killed that area right there. I bet you this control arm will not unbolt. I'm gonna have to cut that out. Wow. It's a piece of shit. So, go ahead, Derek. Pump it up. Out she comes. All right, go ahead and go forward. I was just thinking to myself, this car doesn't need to have a heater because with the radical engine and the exhaust, and the holes in the floor, it already comes preheated. So we can get rid of that heavy ass heater box. And just like so. This is gonna be like the easiest weight reduction ever on this car. It's gonna drop like 30, 40 pounds. Is that it? I think that's it, let's see. Weight savings equals horsepower. We also don't need to worry about a radio since we're gonna have all that horsepower to listen to. So we can just go ahead and get rid of this annoying pimple on the fender. this just because it takes weight off. Get out of there. You know what? Haha, uh -huh, I win. Look at that well ventilated trunk, Derek. Oh wow, they really well <laughs> Thank you.
please. Everything I touch in here is rotted junk. Everything I grab a hold of under this car rips, tears, busts loose, or is just so paper thin I can put my hand through it. But we're going to continue cutting off things that we don't need because lighter is better. <laughs> I just checked to see what gear was in this thing. We never knew. We thought it was an open diff rear end because it was only spinning one tire. But up in the air, if I hold one drum, I can't spin the pinion. So, see, it's, yeah, it tells you that it's a sure grip, which means there's a clutch pack inside the third member that locks up or that spins both tires. And, uh, and the, when you're going around corners, that clutch pack allows one tire to spin faster than the other for corner radiusing. But I was just curious to see what gear was in it. And what I did is I drew a line on the pinion and then on the housing, so those two line up. And then I drew a line on the drum and the backing plate. And you spin the pinion and you count how many times it spins around until that mark lines back up on the drum, one full revolution. And this one ends up being a 323. It's a 323 sure grip, but sadly, this sure grip is done burned up. And on the autocross, you need both tires to spin, because if you don't, it is going to push like crazy coming out of the corner. So I think we're going to have to uh, change the pumpkin in the sink to something that's going to spin both tires. Ooh, see all the crap that blew out of that? Oh. <laughs> That went relatively easy. Well, at least all the guts are still there. So, I only need to buy everything still because it's all junk. Yeah, that's the sounds of garbage right there. So I was making a list on everything I need for the super beater to get it race ready in less than 30 days. Actually less than that because I have other cars I got to work on. And I'm like, you know what? It's much easier if I just make the list and say everything. Because this thing is a hunk of junk. Super Beater is pretty much stripped of everything that we needed to remove from the car. The one last thing Derek is working on right now, which is the upper control arms, but uh, everything is off the car that we need to remove. Axles, third member, uh, leftover pieces inside the car, engine tranny, suspension, anything that was junk has been removed. But if we removed everything that was junk, there would be nothing left of the car. So I have to reinforce what is cool, which is the outside. I got my tubing bender over there. I got some uh, leftover steel just from those sitting outside. So this is all just kind of like scrap steel. And we're going to make some kind of a cage structure to reinforce the super beater because it is in dire need of some strengthening. If we put a 550 horse motor in this thing right now and just stab the throttle, the car would just poop caterpillar up. So we're gonna put a main hoop in here, some door bars that'll run down to the front clip. But I mean, look at these front rails. Ugh. There's not a lot there. And we're also gonna put subfront connectors on this thing. So subfront connectors, a six point cage, and I'm even gonna put some down tubes from the firewall down to the front clip. Cause it's, it's just all junk. But the soup beater will be some pretty badass junk when we're done with it.
Yeah, so I'm just cutting away, and I'm like, oh yeah, I'll cut it back this far, and it should be all right. I can make the rest of this out of some sheet metal and put a leaf spring slider and all that, and then, then I look underneath it, and it is garbage all the way up to the freaking shock tower on both sides. So, actually, you know what? Here we go. <laughs> it's a piece of shit. The super beater is in dire need of something to hold the ass end of this car together. Cardboard! Yeah, no, I'm not actually going to use cardboard, obviously, but no, I made a template real quick, and it's going to uh, overlap over the original, or what's left of the original frame rail. So that is my shape of what I need. Now I just need to make four of these with a flange on the top and bottom so I can fold them or weld them together and have a C channel, just like the original frame rails. But I think we're going to make it one step cooler. I think we might try and dimple dye these, make them lighter, stronger, and cooler looking. Ugh. Well, <laughs> that's my rear clip. This is one of my new toys. This is actually an, a magnetic sheet metal brake. These things are like super expensive, but I got lucky. I was sitting on the pooper, turned on Marketplace, and this thing was on Marketplace for like half of what they sell for new, and this thing was basically new. So I got super lucky on this thing. Oh -ha. It clamps it down, and then as soon as I start pulling up on this handle, you'll start hearing a boom. Six tons of magnetic force. Start. And now we can start the frame rails. That is the start of a frame rail. I gotta do this separate. I gotta do this on my uh, bead roller because it has a radius to it. Officially, super beater frame rail pieces. Son of a all right, now that I got the one side all mocked up, see, I'm trying to get these in place so I know where to trim and where to cut and where to put my fuel cell, and because we're gonna add some fancy bead rolls to this thing, so I gotta just mock everything up real quick. Son of a... I cut two of the same freaking side. I think we're getting a lot better at this, Derek. This one, it's like the fifth one came out perfect. And the reason I say five is because, yeah, I done screwed up on one and made two of one side. But yeah, this is uh, the beginnings of our frame rail. See the top and bottom, I can just put those in the sheet metal brake and fold them. But when it come to this part, I had to use the uh, bead roller to accomplish that. It came out pretty spiffy. All right, 30 minutes later, I have the corrected piece. Why didn't you catch that, Derek? <laughs> you went ahead and let me screw up all on my own. You could have caught that. All right, I am back from filming Roadkill Garage. That was a week long of working on Dulcich's D100. But it was a lot of fun. I had a good time with both David and and uh, Dulcich, and the crew is also awesome. They're great to work with. Now back to the B. 
So I made my rear cross rail, and yes, I know the cross rails are supposed to go like all the way out to here, but you know what? That's how wide the sheet I had was, and this is what we're working on, so I don't care. But if you notice, I did do like the cool dimple die look to it, you know, which makes it lighter and stronger. So it got me thinking, I'm like, these frame rails that I made, I'm like, you know what? Let's dimple die these rear frame rails. So dimple die, we will. I'm gonna pull them back out because they're only sheet metal, sheet metal screwed in place. Dimple die them and then final weld them in place so then I can start making the cage for this thing. Got all my holes drilled, I'm just dimple dialing right now. It's just an inch and a half hole saw. And I have a special die right here, I'll show you. Nothing too special, it's not like some trade secret or anything, people make these, but yeah, there's a, here's my dimple die, as you can see, it's got a chamfer on one end, it's got the male chamfer and the female chamfer, you press two together, and it makes the cool dimple dyed holes. So I got finished doing this one, one more rail, and the frame rails are complete, and they will look a bitchin' in the super beater. So I had to make these rear rails in two pieces. That's, that's the only way I can make it, unless you got a giant press machine that can stamp this out. But it's all dimple dyed, and I can weld the two halves together, and it looks bitchin'. The only thing I screwed up with on the driver's side rail is my holes are not perfectly lined up. I uh, messed up on my measurement on one side, but not a big deal. It's still gonna look absolutely bitchin' under the car. I can't wait to see this thing. See the rear suspension and the cage and everything done in this car. People are gonna lose their minds when they see the rear clip on this car. The rear frame rails are in place. Go ahead and check it out. Yep, they're all welded in, all set. And now it is time to move on to the suspension part of this so then I can start making the cage. The Because uh, I kind of wanted the cage to tie into this, but I may or may not, I don't know. This is all just on the fly. But those of you that don't know what this is, this is what's called a leaf spring slider. So instead of having a shackle that swings with the expansion of the leaf spring, this slides. You notice the slide there. And it's got a bearing in it and all that. I like these because then it takes away the leaf spring sway under the car. It makes it nice and solid and rigid side to side, but still allows for a nice, smooth, linear expansion of the leaf spring. And uh, I think this keeps the spring rate more consistent on the leaf spring because it's not swinging, which I don't know, may or may not add. Uh, spring rate to it but uh the linear expansion here won't change it at all and i need to figure out how i'm going to mount this to the car so it's going to go on top of actually these are the bu the solid bushings that go inside the leaf spring and then i need to figure out a way that i can mount this to the frame rail and then maybe have the cage come down and tie it to it somehow so i need to get these welded in place and then i can move forward with the cage so i'm going to go ahead and Finger this out. I've got an idea in my head. I just have to try and get it out of my head and onto the car. So I'll get back with you in a second. Okay, so I figured out a game plan. I'm like, how can I do this in less steps and make multiple and make the suspension and the cage kind of work together with less work? And I'm like, all right, I need to figure out a way to do this like three in one, four in one, or whatever. And so if you look, I've got some tubing run across the rails here. Now, I went ahead and utilized my dimple die holes as a frame structure so it's going to not it's going to tie the two sides of the rail together it's going to tie both rails together the cage is going to come down and attach to it it's going to hold my leaf spring slider which i have notched front and back that's going to sit on the bottom sides of the tubes it's going to work perfect and it's lighter
finally getting to the point where I can start building a cage for the super beater. I've got some pickup points here that I've made real quick and I'm not trying to make this thing super fancy. I'm just trying to find something I can actually freaking weld to in this car. Um, and I had a piece of square, so cut it in half, put a little bit more and bend in it, and I can put it right there, and then I can box this in, and that'll give me a good structure point right there, which is door jam, rocker, and well, that's it really, and uh, hopefully there's enough rocker there. But what I am gonna do is when the main hoop comes up, I'm gonna run another bar over, and that's gonna go to a pickup point right here, which is what I made. I, normally I would go to right here, which is the torsion support, but it's so rotted that uh, there's, I'm just kind of afraid to even attach a cage to it. So I'm gonna have to put subframe connectors on this just so the front or the rear frame rail and the front frame rail tie together without really needing anything in the middle and then I might even make more points that go from the cage down to the uh, subframe connector just just trying to tie this Titanic in enough points to where it won't go and buckle up when we're racing it it is that junk That makes four points for the cage done in the center of the chassis. So that way I can start making the main hoop. And actually I can start running it to the back too, but I don't really need a pickup point to make back here because I'm just gonna go ahead and attach it to my uh, uh, leaf spring slider bar. Cause that's, that actually goes through the frame rail. So it, it just, it'll conglomerate, combal it all up. Combal, it'll, yeah, it'll combal it all up into one solid joint. So I'm gonna go ahead and start making a template for my roll cage. Making our main hoop right now. This is the most critical part of the cage. I hope I did my math correctly. I need 70 degrees, but we gotta go past that a little bit to allow for a spring back. All right. It fits pretty damn good. I'm actually happy with it. Check it out. It's square, vertical. It's even on both sides. Look at that hoop. That thing is pretty. Now I can go ahead and tack it in place. I even recessed it into my lower plate. So, yep. Super Beater is going to be beefed. So we're back at it on the Super B, another day making roll bars, but the main hoop is done. Now the hard part is done. Now I just gotta start laying other tubing in place that will attach to this. And this long piece of tubing you see right here, this is going to be my down tubes that come off of the main hoop to the rear clip. Just making my notches so now this will attach to the, uh, the main hoop. This is a tubing notcher. All right, come check it out. A lot of you guys already know this stuff, but some the ones that don't, there you go. Look at that. Wow. <laughs> Simple tools, I like them. Yeah, I can't get the uh, rear part of the bar to touch the uh, tubing that I want to because the package tray is in the way. All right, I think that'll do it.
Working on the driver's side door bar right now. Been making some more progress on the cage, actually adding some down tubes to the front clip to help make it more rigid and prevent the nose from going crink. So what I had done here is this, I mean, this whole car is being, all the, the entire cage from this car is being built just from leftover tubing I had on the side of the house. That's why it's all rusty or, you know, it has some flash rust on it. None of this metal is super clean because it's been sitting outside. But let me show you what I did real quick. So this will end up being, a, let's see, a two, four, six, and this will end up being an eight point cage. So if you notice, I have two bars here, one there and one way over there. They're going uphill to the firewall, actually the cowl. So what I had done is hole saw that, that's where the pipe comes up. I made a plate that goes there that's also hole sawed, you can see over here. Yep, and then it's gonna go down to the front clip. And that is all just to make the front clip more rigid and solid. Like if this car was actually solid to begin with, this would be a damn stiff car. But now it's just going to be a stiff car because there's really no unibody structure left to hold the thing together. So we're holding the car together with cage. Uh, I finished cutting out my subframe connectors. These are a 120 wall 2x2. Two two. Normally I use 095, but I had this, so we're using it. So I have it to where I cut the back side to where it fits to the front of the rear frame rail right here. And then the front, I notch the torsion support so this goes through the frame rail and then attaches to the front part of the frame rail right before it kicks up. There's not a whole lot of metal here as you can see. That is just all rotted out and Pretty much half of the square is just all rusty metal, so it's probably just gonna, actually my finger just went right through it. So, the only reason I'm even you doing this is to reinforce this right here. This is the socket that houses the torsion bar. As long as this from here forward could be gone, but as long as from here to here is good, it'll hold the torsion bars. So this right here is pretty much the only thing that's gonna hold the transmission up and the torsion bars because there's, there's, no, there's nothing left of this. So I got my subframe connector jacked up in place to hold it and uh, oh, holy crap. It's gonna be super easy to weld this one in because there's no floor. So I can weld it from the top as well. That's gonna be very convenient. <laughs> I actually kind of dig that. Floors should be optional in these things. Check it out, Marketplace has delivered on some cool seats, cheap. I've got to mount them, however. I did make this bar, so I made it where it goes across and it kind of humps over the trans tunnel and it connects back over. And now I need to make seat brackets for that. I went ahead and got the subframe connectors all welded in, so they're all welded in and done. Actually, show you underneath. Yeah. <laughs> Jalopy race car, I love it. All right, I took some of all the scrap pieces I had and I went ahead and made an adjustable seat bracket for the super beater. Check it out. So it clamps onto the tube and we have adjustable holes so it can tilt forward or back and go up and down. This side here, since it's the passenger side, it's just fixed. Don't care if your head's hitting the ceiling. Hey, that's just more protection for me because it's going to squish on you before it hits me. All right. I'm working on the uh, window net right now. I'm gonna use one of my old seat belts, Mopar B-body seat belt. This will actually be the release 
for the window net. Oh, I've got my upper bar in place. Look, our seats are mounted. We got belts. So this is gonna go right here. And I'm gonna make another bar that comes over, comes down, and that's where my uh, seat belt release is gonna be at. So this will all come together and look like super badass race car. I'm actually pretty excited to see this thing. And then I'm gonna go ahead and TIG weld the fuel cell together so that way I can drop that in the car. And then uh, I'm waiting on a bunch of stuff to show up, but we can go ahead and put the Brett master cylinder in and a couple other little things. So it's like the snowball is finally starting to come together. my latch and my receiver or whatever you call it freaking wind is killing me Man. <clears throat> I did an old school window net where it flings from the top you're probably wondering why. Why would I do that? Well, the reason is to make it easier to get in the car. See, it has the bar that goes downhill. If I had a rod that came, or if I had a piece of tubing that came up and that's what it went to, you have this big piece of tubing in the way, which is the mistake I made on the 71 RT. So now, this just goes like that. Actually, I want to try it. You can get in. Easy to get in. I like it. Still super windy today, but we have made a bunch of progress. And the next thing we're going to do is go ahead and put the pitman arm and the idler arm. And this isn't a regular pitman arm, and that's not a regular idler arm either. This is actually a longer one from Pro Forged. What it does is it, it makes the uh, steering react faster because the longer the arm you have on it, the more mechanical leverage you have, which makes it react, it makes the steering react faster. So instead of like, 18 to 1 steering box with this on there it's like say 16 to 1 I don't know the exact number but I believe it increases it uh, or it drops the ratio uh, two full points and both of these are longer one problem you will have though is header clearance sometimes those will actually run into the headers and you kind of need a ding notch hammer whatever on the headers to make sure you get your full steering motion but Derek's gonna go ahead and install those and I'm going to finish putting the fuel cell in the super beater. Hopefully we are done with the hurricane winds from yesterday and the day before and back to some normal weather. You can see the trees are still blowing, but they're not toppling over. I need to try and get the brakes, or I'm gonna, I need to get the master cylinder, the brake lines, the fuel lines, and hopefully get the tranny cooler mounted today. I got the switch panel mounted this morning. That was just a simple two brackets welded. Now that's screwed on there. The master cylinder, however, is going to be a little bit more. So this car used to be power drum brakes. Yeah, I know my hair is just crazy, but uh, oh well. I haven't got a haircut yet. I will eventually. Just time. Anyways, back to the super beater. So this was a power brake drum car. And that takes a different uh, bracket, that a different sandwich bracket that the uh, brake booster attaches to. The manual brake cars, the master cylinder actually bolts right to this plate, which is these lower four holes. Well, the lower four holes blocks off the brake booster plate. So I need to hole saw that out, so that way this will bolt there. Then I can bolt the master cylinder to it. And I've got to make some kind of push rod setup for it because I don't have one. Should have everything to do the brake line, so I'm not too worried about that. And my trans cooler 
So here's my tra trans cooler. This is actually intended to be an oil cooler, but we're gonna use it as a trans cooler. And so we're gonna try and get as much rear weight out of this car as possible. I'm actually gonna mount this guy back here. So that'll add, you know, five pounds of forward bite. So this car's gonna be enough nose weight as it is. We need to try and get as much rear weight as we can. Uh, I would like to remove the fenders, the hood, the grill, the, the bumper assembly, but that would really kind of take away the look of the car. So not going to do that. That'll work. Oh yeah, functioning brake pedal attached to the two bolt mash cylinder. Now I just need to uh, clean up these grungy old fittings here so I can reuse them. This car is also being built for duct tape drag. So I have to keep in mind the safety stuff required for duct tape drag, which is the reason I put a window net in it, which it's there, it's just not hanging down. But it also needs a master disconnect switch it's going to need a neutral safety switch and it's going to need a rear firewall. So all little things I got to do and where I'm going to mount this uh, master switch, I'm going to put it right here, right next to the switch panel because that way it's right there and easy access for the driver. I need to take some measurements real quick and then I'll be able to figure out how high is up for a master disconnect switch. Got the brake bias, my master switch, the switch panel, all in this tight, neat little area. It'll work out perfect. Right now I am making brake lines. I'm gonna work on the fronts first and then I need to go backwards to tie into the brake bias and then to go all the way back to the rear axle. So it's just gonna be long and tedious part of just making brake lines. Check it out, perfect every time. Bolts like that thing ain't gonna fit. I literally did this whole thing just off measurements and bends. So I'm hoping it fits in the car. This is gonna go from the master cylinder through the firewall, along the firewall, down the rocker, across the floor pan, and then to the brake bias. So I'm hoping it fits. I don't wanna have to make another one. I would wiggle There is a ton of work that has had to go into this thing. Like you wouldn't think so, it being all ratty and junk, but man, there is a crap load of work in the, to get making this thing run and drive. Okay. Well, I can tighten up my fittings and officially the brakes are done. The brake by it, the master cylinder's in, the front lines are done. Well, never mind, the brakes aren't done. Like, still gonna, I'm waiting on the front brakes to show up from Willwood and then then I still gotta bleed them. No, we're even close. So I got a spool of the soft 3 8 fuel line, or tubing, I would say. And I'm gonna just, uh, I, this is not gonna be enough, but I'm just gonna go as far forward as I can with this and just kind of bend it in place. Cause this is the soft stuff, so I can, I'm just gonna make it kind of in the car and bend it as it goes, but, uh, as far as this goes, is as far as the hard line is going to. You know, I just realized too, 
with the subframe connectors on this car, it gives me a straight shot all the way to the front. I don't have to dog leg over to the rocker or nothing like that. So that is mucho betters. And I will take it. So it means I can just slip this thing on down in there. Do 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 do. And I can actually, if I'm good, I can snake it through the hole that the uh, fuel line goes through from here. Let's see. Success. So trying to be a little bit sneaky right now. We're hiding the MS, well, I would say MSD box, but it's the Street Fire box, which is the budget box for CD ignition. And you would think we wouldn't have to hide a budget box, but this thing is actually going to be pretty badass looking. And badass, thing look, badass looking means dollar signs. And when we take this to duct tape drags, we need it to pass for under $5,000 value type deal. You know, most people are gonna be like, oh, no way in hell a Super B, you know, is worth way more than five grand. But they haven't seen this rotted Super B. They're gonna think, oh, roll cage, race car. No, <laughs> the cage is merely structure. We did not want to add 200 pounds of roll cage to this thing, but we had to, because the car was probably missing 150 pounds of metal. <laughs> that mother nature took back. <laughs> so, multiple things going on here, hiding the box and getting the weight down low and shorter wires, which means less ugliness. All you'll see under the hood, you'll just see the, uh, uh, the pickup wires. You won't see the box, the ignition wires, none of that crap. It's all ugly, you don't wanna see that crap. That's why carbureted cars are so cool is because there's no wiring and I'm going to have as little wiring showing as possible, hiding that thing right there. Uh, wiring time. The super non-exciting part of a build. I don't know. I just... When the wiring is done, you respect it. But as you're doing it, it literally looks like you've done nothing for hours. Well, not so much on this car, because there's only you know, going to be so many wires. But when you're wiring up like a build car, you got hours and hours and hours into wiring and then you stand back and look at what you've done and you don't really see a whole lot. So I'm going to save you guys that and you will just see this piece and the wiring done when it goes in the car. Looks like a jellyfish, huh, Derek? Yeah. <laughs> Too bad we can't just run this car on one wire. It had to have electric fans and it had to have a trans cooler fan, but Electric fans make horsepowers, so that's why we did that. Plus, mechanical fans, if you don't have a really good one and you're revving the thing to the moon, the fan will actually fold into the radiator. Ask me how I know that. Oh yeah, cold case radiators. I like promoting products that I personally know work. And luckily, Cold Case contacted me and they wanted to help us out with the autocross cars. So they graciously donated, sponsored a radiator, both for the 70B and the 71RT. Let's go ahead and back up and show you why. If you see this engine right here, this is the engine that was in the Super B. There's a reason it's not going back in the Super B. This engine is done locked up, and it's because we didn't have enough radiator to keep it cool when we were racing it out in the out in the uh, you know the dirt roads up in North Dakota. Now, granted, we didn't have a you know water temperature gauge, but you know what? If the radiator is good enough, we didn't need one anyway, right? This, in fact, is the exact same radiator that's in the General Lee. 115 degree temperatures with the AC on. Yes, AC and my 550 horsepower big block in the General Lee does not overheat. Runs 190 degrees, just at what I wanted it to, all summer long, sitting in traffic. In Vegas, we have traffic now. All of California is moving in, you know? So I have, you better have to upgrade your cooling system just from all the influx of Californians. But uh, I know this works in that. And so without AC going in the Super B, this thing will work perfect. And come check out what they gave us here. 
So not only do we have this super shiny polished radiator, which is really cool looking, but we got electric fans, we got the shroud, we got the mounting brackets, and look, we even got the wiring harness that they gave us. So look, we got relays, we got the water temp sensor. So all this is going to work perfect in the B. And look at the gauge wiring on this. This is some heavy duty stuff. This is what you want to see. You don't want to see undersized wiring. And look, it's all automated. Look, they got the temp sensor for you. So you don't have to do anything. Yep, I like it. We're going to use all of this in the Super B. We're not going to get it in right now because I still got to put the engine and transmission in the car and I don't want to damage this pretty radiator. So we're going to go ahead and assemble it all up and get it ready to go in. So that way, once the engine is in, then the radiator can follow and hopefully we go Wah! and make some noise and not overheat during cam break in. Just got one of the fatties mounted 295 5015 on that badass looking slot, which that slot was a pain in the ass to mount that tire to. It uh, had to be mounted upside down. Otherwise, there was no way to get it on. Here's a problem though. See, we have two 65s for the front, and I just found out that these front rims are only sevens. You don't want to put two 65s on a seven. It creates too much of a crown on the sidewall, and it'll handle bad. It'll be all like squish, 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 and you don't want that. So digging around, <laughs> those are the rims that come on Little Red Expresses, and it's an eight. So luckily, that eight can be used, and while it's spinning, it will resemble that. So we're going to go ahead and put the 265s on that uh, Little Red Express wheel and that's going to go in the front of the Super Beater. Way, way easier than that other tire. So I was experimenting last night on exhaust. I'm really picky about what the exhaust looks like and sounds like. So I have chosen these shorty stumpy porter mufflers here. Cause look, we can see straight through them and it'll, they're just big enough to muffle out some of the bad, like open header noises at low RPM, but they will be loud enough to shriek and I wanted the shriekness to come right out the sides of the car. You know, since the quarter panels are so mint on this thing that uh, I came up with this little doohickey right there. I think it looks cool. Yeah, racing car. Anyway, so it's going to come right out of the quarter panel right there. And I'm making the other piece for the other side right now. It's just solid Bondo. Oh yeah, I just got blinged out.
I sent pictures of the super beater to QA1 and they came back at me and they were like, yes, we want to help this car. And help us, they did. Check out what we got here and let me explain what I have done here. So that way it'll make sense to you guys. Yeah, it's not coilover suspension. It's not, you know, their uh, K-frame. So let me explain why I have what I have right here. To start off with, you will notice I have these nice QA1 upper control arms. And these are on all of my chargers. told you see I love promoting products that I know work and personally know work the Q the upper control arms these add three degrees of caster and they will get rid of the deflection that your stock stamped upper control arms will so of course I run them I abuse the crap out of my cars so I don't want my upper control arms going yeah I want those things rigid strong winning and then we've got the lower control arms. These, of course, more rigid, stronger, and they already come pre-assembled. See, the problem with the lower control arms on Mopars is they're a stamped steel. And unless you box them in, they are really weak. They will flex and twist and cause you all kinds of problems and sometimes bend or break or fold and buckle. So I went ahead and got their lower control arms because we're going to abuse the crap out of this car. So, of course, we need this. Now, you would think, well, you got this and this. Why didn't you just get their K-frame? <laughs> well, the reason I didn't get the K-frame is because this car is so rusty that uh, I was afraid if I tried to remove the K-frame that it's going to take section of the of the frame rails with it or the bolts would or the uh, nuts welded to the, the frame rail would come out. Now, I don't think it would really do that, but uh, yeah, I just decided, you know what, we'll leave the stock K-frame in this car. Now, you will see some ball joints here, and you're probably like, what the hell? These don't look like ball joints for a lower control, for a, the, the spindle on a Mopar, and you would be right. These ball joints here are actually one inch taller upper ball joints that I ordered extra in case I wanted to fix the uh, geometry on the upper control arms. Now, it's not nothing QA1 did. That they mimicked the, uh, this is the, you know, this is actually, it's a Moog, yeah, K23. So, no, that's a Pro Forge, K23. The, uh, what this does, one inch longer ball joint, is it will help with the poor geometry on a factory big block or a factory B body Mopar. I didn't mean to say big block, but B body. You know, when you think B body, you think big, so that's, it came out big block. But, uh, so, but we're running a one inch taller upper upper ball joint, it puts a little bit more angle in the upper control arm, which will help with camber gain. And it, that's why I went with this route. Now, I am working on a design, and I should have it done in time for this car. That's why these are not in the control arms yet, is I, I'm, have, I'm making a prototype for a taller, it's a bolt-on bracket, the factory B-body Mopar spindle into a taller spindle, and I might not even need this. So that I, I'm, this is debatable. I may use this, I may not. All right, now we've got our strut rods. These attach to the lower control arms, and then they go to the K-frame, and that keeps the control arm from doing this deal. You know, don't want this deal. You want that lower control arm, uh, strong. And what it does is it gets rid of the factory bushings and it converts it to a heim joint. Now, as long as there is a bushing somewhere in the control arm, you know, it, it doesn't have to have a bushing on both sides. I, I don't agree with running heims on upper control arms or lower control arms all the way around. You want something to give in the suspension. Otherwise, it's going to beat the crap out of the chassis, the bolt, the uh, mounting location. So since the lower control arm has a bushing here, I decided the heim joint there would be perfectly fine. And what it does is it keeps the control arm from gaining or losing caster moving back and forth. And it will actually strengthen this guy and get rid of some of the deflection in it. All right. And with those upper control arms, pretty common. 
the uh, factory camera bolts on this car <laughs> were garbage. So they did send me some of these. All right, now we've got shocks. These are double adjustable shocks, front and rear. Now, you may be thinking that's overkill, but see, this is gonna be a multi-purpose car. It's going to be for autocross. We may do some off-roading with it, minor off-roading. Uh, we're gonna do drag racing with it, all kinds of things. And so I wanted to be able to tune the shocks to any situation that we get into. Plus, if we're autocrossing, and hey, I need a little bit more compression on the on the fronts. I need a little bit more less damping on the rebounds, uh, front or back, vice versa. I can then do that with these shocks. I can really dial in this car to annihilate the jalopy competition. I set your standards low. Jalopy class for the win. <laughs> All right, we're okay. Now you'll notice there is not a QA1 sway bar here. There's a reason for that. I'm going to run the factory lightweight sway bar. See, this car, you know, we're, we actually have been trying to keep this car budget, budget. I would love to put a locker in this thing so that way it'll unload the rear diff and so the car will cut into the corner on entry better. Spools, I've learned all this from circle track racing and all that. Spools are terrible for cornering. Yeah, you drag race guys, you know this. You try to make that corner off the exit of the track, yeah so it's the same thing when you're autocrossing road racing whatever so here's my theory the lightweight sway bar is going to add to the body roll which is going to help me unload the inner rear tire mid corner which will then loosen the car up and, and allow the car to rotate if I had a big sway bar in a car it would help keep the car flat and it would keep the rear tires more loaded evenly. I don't want that. I, with a spool, I need to unload one of the inner, the inner rear tire. So I'm just trying to thunk ahead, see? All right, I think that sums it up. And I am super excited to install all of this shiny, pretty QA1 stuff in this rotted hunk of junk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So this is going to be great for the super beater and I'm going to go ahead and slide them in place Oh man, I should take some compression out of it first Ugh. Oh wow We're going to Take some compression out of that sucker. Oop, there we go. Bam. up everything too. You know, the more something is greased, the less likely something will squeak. It ain't gonna hurt nothing either. Plus, the bushings will slide on easier. Aha! Shove that guy up in there. Oh yeah, fuel cell's not looking so lonely now. Got the battery box in it. And 
let me just say this. It's, it is true, you get what you pay for. And with this car, we've been trying to penny pinch on everything that we could. And that battery box is one of them. That's an Amazon, you know, like wannabe Taylor Wires battery box. Because, you know, the Taylor Wires one was like, you know, 30 bucks more. So I'm like, well, okay, we'll save 30 bucks and we'll get the Amazon box. Well, then it shows up in this thin little box. I'm like, that's not a big enough for a battery box. No, it comes in like six different pieces and they want you to bolt the, alum bolt the aluminum box together with these chintzy little screws. Well, I end up, you know, TIG welding the sides up to make the box. And then, you know, the cable they give you, it's shit cable. I I'm going to use it because I have it, but... I would have much rather just spent the $30 more and gotten a real battery box instead of the crappy Chinese knockoff. All right, I kind of beat you guys to the gun a little bit. I just, I just wanted to see what the spoiler looked like on it real quick. I had my buddy bend this up for me real quick, the one that did the uh, bracket for the spindle. So I had to set it on there to see what it looked like and it did not disappoint. That's going to look awesome. Of course, you know, at like autocross speeds, you know, they try and keep it like under 75 miles an hour for like insurance reasons. <laughs> it's not gonna do a whole lot, but it will look bitchin' not doing a whole lot. We are under the beater. We got the fuel cell, we got the battery box, and we got an axle that has no third member in it, but right there it is. So this car actually had a three, actually it's in the bucket over there. It was a 323 sure grip, but we know for a fact it was burned up because we were hot dogging this thing out in the country at Mike's place. It was a one tire fire, but when we pulled the gear out, it was a sure grip. So the clutch packs in that sure grip smoked it plus 323 is it's an okay gear but we kind of want to make this car race ready for not only autocross but also duct tape drags and duct tape drags we need a better shit and get gear man so we can go through the gears this is a 391 that i had sitting in the backyard it had no it had the ring and pinion and it had the case that's all it had i think it had the yoke on it but it had no differential. My buddies at uh, Dan's driveline hooked me up with a spool. So yeah, this thing's got a spool in it. The only bad thing is it's not exactly what I wanted, but it was on the cheap, and we've been building this car on the cheap. Now, the bad things with a spool, they are terrible for corners. I've had to rethink my front suspension to allow the car to unload the rear tire the inner rear tire to allow the thing to rotate a little better so we got like stock sway bar and we're gonna play with the shocks and you know a couple other things to you know try and make that spool work but it ain't really gonna work at all when it's sitting on the ground i hate this part this is where a lift would be really nice all right Come on, you heavy bastard. All right. Oh. It's actually lighter with the spool in it. Oh, oh that wasn't bad at all. Carolina Racing Supply. Oh yeah, they hooked me up. They're like, dude, if you're gonna work on the ground, at least work on a mat. So they sent me two pit mats. And you know, I dirt track race too. And so always in the pits, on the ground, in the dirt. But it would be now that I have these suckers, they're an inch thick. I mean, I can pound on this thing with my knees and I'll no longer have pants that look like that. So. I'm glad I have these mats now, so now I can work 
and not freeze my butt on the ground and just shove some axles in because that's what I'm doing right now. But uh, if you guys are interested, Carolina Racing Supply. Yep, right there out of Mooresville, North Carolina. I wish I was back there, man. That's where all the good racing stuff is at. like badass racing car motor right <laughs> or lack thereof but uh, I had to speed the process up last night because we were spending it would I mean I didn't even finish the motor till like 10 30 last night by the time we got it out here so there was no way we were gonna get the engine transmission bolted together and in the car by last night but at least today we can put the engine in in the daylight and we prepped everything out and got it all ready so we got our converter we got the starter we got all our hardware cleaned up we got our our uh, marketplace transmission so we get that mated to that and then take that and that and plop it into that a couple things need to happen first though is so this is the torque side of the engine this is just a standard you know isolator motor mount in which when this thing wraps up and we get the hammer to the floor this thing's going to go bink and separate so what I am going to do is I've just cut some plates here. I am going to weld these plates in there just to keep the thing from separating. The car is ready for its horsey powers. And this engine here should make like 500. You know, it has those cheapo dinosaur forged pistons in it. It's got ported 906 heads. You know, it's got that Howard's cam. It's got this Mopar wedge intake manifold. And with some headers, there's no reason this thing shouldn't be making like between 490 and 510. There's, that's the window that it should be making. I know it doesn't look like it, but it will. It is just about to go in. We've actually been dressing the engine up to make things simpler in the process on getting this thing running and driving. So I've already got my starter on, I got my cables run, and then I'll attach them to the firewall once that's done. We've already got the flex plate bolt up. Yep, there's the part where I painted. That's already all bolted up. Of course, the transmission's on. We already got the uh, dipstick on, the dipstick tube. And what we're gonna try right now is bolting the headers to the engine and then trying to drop the whole engine trans and, and headers in the car in one piece. Oh, and also, look at the Aspen. The Aspen with rally wheels and tires is not so hideous. Yep. We are actually going to uh, do some test and tuning on this thing at Matt's to get it ready for the off-road race. I figure, oh, what the hell? Let's just take it to Matt's. 
we'll get the engine all broke in and we'll be able to get the you know get all the bugs worked out while we're playing with it and actually competing at mats right take advantage of my free entry all right Derek let's make some progress all right you going wait, 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 wait. All right, let's go in. All right, go down, Derek. This sucker went in with the headers on it. No. How the fuck is it doing that? Man, he just wastes all that oil, all that fresh oil. So yeah, there is still an issue with the rear seal. Like the engine at that 45 degree angle filled up the bell housing. So when we leveled it out, it all just poured out. I can't believe how bad that rear seal is. I guess there really is something wrong with this block. Maybe it's cracked, it's something. Cause that's a total different seal cap and it's a new seal top and bottom. And that leaked really bad. But I am actually glad that by the time this episode airs, we'd already been done racing. So you guys won't know that it's a leaky piece of crap before we go racing. That's one. Jesus, thing's just freaking raining rust on me. All right, well, as I was saying earlier, these are the AR idler and pitman and it won't steer hits the headers so bashing will have to commence <laughs> Aha. all good all right i was kind of dreading this part looking down the torsion bar hole to make sure that the torch bar will go in without having to heat up and knock in the headers because they're kind of a pain in the ass once they're in the car. And I was looking through there and I'm like, crap, I can't see the hole. And then I was like, oh wait, that's just floorboard. There's the hole. <laughs> and problem solved. Both torsion bars will go in without having to modify the headers. I'm in the middle of doing accessories right now, but in the back of my mind is still, how bad is this engine going to leak? I mean, am I gonna have to bring bundles of, you know, my baby's diapers and ratchet strap them to the transmission to keep this thing alive? I mean, wow, this block is junk. No wonder he parked this motor 10 years ago. Man, there's still a lot of crap to do. I need to make a list. Ugh. All right, go ahead and drop it in place, see what we got here. You know, be sure and scratch it on everything as you go in though, Derek. Wait a second. Wait a tick. Oh, it's a 22 inch core sport. Dang it. Cutting. Horsepowers. Of course, supports a little smushed it on the bottom. Ah, that radiator now makes this all look super good. And it's going to free up horsey powers that it's electric fans. So thank you, Cold Case. I mean, I know these work, I've got them in my other cars. So I have a zero problems knowing that this radiator is going to cool this beast in this car burning tires around the autocross all right it's tuesday so 
We got two days to get this car done. Mike just showed up. He got, he brought me the MSD distributor that we need, but the cap was busted on it. So we're taking the distributor that I have, which is for a low deck. We're gonna rob the cap and rotor off that, put it on here, but I'm also going to recurve the distributor. I want to limit the amount of mechanical advance it has so it has more initial. And then we're gonna soften up the uh, uh, mechanical advance so that way it snaps open faster, gets more timing faster, and bigger boom. I like that stuff. So I'm gonna go ahead and get this done and then get back out there. And I ended up dropping the oil pan again to fix that oil leak because that was way too bad. Like seriously, not good. So something had to have been wrong up in there. Maybe, I don't know. I just took it back. I didn't see anything visibly wrong, but I took it back apart and we're gonna re-silicone the crap out of it and bolt it all back together and hopefully that fixes it. Got a lot to do in two days. Yeah, we got two days to build this car and Mike is worried about <laughs> critical things like painting his Ninja Turtle tachometer. Just can't stand having that green tack in his car. Important things. Let's do a size comparison here. Hold that one up. You know, if I, if I stand back, yeah, if you go like that, it's the same size. But yeah, we're putting our racing car steering wheel on, taking our boat wheel off. That might be a little too twitchy, but we'll find out. Gary gave that to us, and so we have to put it on. That's all right, though. Gary's racing, too, so when we kick his ass with it, we'll just say that the steering wheel was the magic touch. I am going to goober the crap out of this thing with silicone to make sure it doesn't leak this time. So, so something's got to be wrong with this block in order to the way it leaked it did. But uh, so maybe Mike was right. Maybe he wasn't lying after all. Derek is over there getting oil pan ready again, cleaning that up. Mike is farting around doing something. I don't know. He's not really that important. Yeah, it's like two hours later and he's still working on his tack. I let the paint dry. Come on. <laughs> you know, that's a mint rally dash. Right. People are going to cry when they see you putting screw holes in it. Yep. Right to my precise measurement. Oh. Are you proud of your tack now that it's painted orange? And Oh, yeah. That is getting proper Joe Dirtish now. Look, the tack matches the Super B stripe. Orange with the white stripe. And look, we got the Joe Dirt throttle pedal, and we've got the matching steering wheel to the rusty front wheels. We are just like styled out on this thing. Actually, you know, it's quick release right now. If we were girls, our clothes would match or whatever. Or yeah. How did they do that? And These we... pants don't go with this shirt. Well, now the tack goes with the car. <laughs> yeah, now the tack goes with and the, the car. steering wheel. And... Now you just need something to actually mount the throttle pedal to the sides of the header. Yeah, the Bluetooth throttle pedal doesn't work so well. <laughs> yeah. Derek took apart the carburetor so that way I can clean it up and rebuild it. Do you know what we don't have? Money, fame, no, fortune. The, the grant. No, it came with it. Yeah. No, no, he sent it with it. Where's oh, okay. it was taped to it? Where's that? Oh, this is built here. Yeah. I just meant the cover and the rest of it. I guess that adds weight, so we'll leave it off. All right, oil pan is back on. I hope it seals. If it doesn't, it's getting sent anyways. So if you remember back when I was putting the hard line in this car for the fuel line, I said wherever it stopped is as far as it's gonna go. Well, it stopped right next to the header, right here. So I'm just gonna throw a little bit of this on there and from here to there, that will get us in the clear. This is some heat wrap that I had left over in my junk pile. Actually, I wouldn't really call this junk because this stuff's expensive, but I had some extra. So this will work out perfect to be able to protect our fuel line from going. Is that short people problems? Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? Plugs? Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you're being short as you are, why don't you just stand underneath it and put them in? The header will be in the way. So uh, even though we've got this badass radiator from Cold Case, which is actually pretty good, one problem, it's for a small block. And I, I didn't even catch it until we were going to put it in the car. 
And so we're actually having to take some extra hoses, cut them and shape them to slinky dink it from one side to the other so then it will attach to the water pump because the water neck is way over there and it needed to be right here. Well, the radiator hose situation is solved. Now I just gotta take care of the wiring. Luckily, there's only like four wires, so I just need to route those couple of wires and Derek got the plugs in. Then we'll put oil in it, prime it, put the correct distributor in it, plug wires. Oh, then I gotta lengthen the throttle linkage. I gotta, I gotta not throttle linkage, but the bracket. I gotta raise this up about an inch and a quarter, so that way it'll work with the, uh, uh, the, the carburetor, because this manifold is like an inch and a half taller than a stock manifold. The list is kind of getting some things knocked off of it. Everything is wired up. Ah, can't wait to hit this button and watch it go. But it won't do that yet. We still got to put plug wires, coil wire, carburetor, still a lot to do, but at least it makes the twinkly doodads. <laughs> I know it won't look like much, but yesterday was a lot of progress on this thing. To make further progress, I need to get the carburetor on it. Oh, I started uh, modifying the uh, throttle linkage bracket that actually holds the cable, because this taller intake manifold, the stock setup won't work with it. So I started on that last night, but then it got a little bit late and we started drinking beer. And then, you know, of course, you know, progress stopped. <laughs> and right now, I am actually working on El Carburetor. So this is an old, I, the story I have on this carburetor, it's a dyno carburetor. And get this wizardry back together, our fancy toilet here, and then plop it on the 70, <laughs> it's like I was getting ready to grapple bolt. <laughs> bolt, you wanna be the new power plant? <laughs> Now that is all gooder, just tightening up my fuel rail. Then I can run my fuel line to it, pull the distributor, prime the engine, and hopefully we have oil pressure. I didn't build this motor. All I did was drop the oil pan, check the bearings to make sure it wasn't messed up because he thought it rod knocked, and then I put another real rear seal in it. So hopefully this thing has oil pressure, hopefully it might tighten all his fittings. I know Mike attached his freaking oil pressure line here to the freaking battery cable, which was touching the mat, the main power. So I guess he forgot that, uh, you know, brass and copper is conductive. And so if I would have turned that main power on, it would have went poof. <laughs> so fix that. Now let's pull this distributor drive gear out. Cause this also drives the oil pump, but we can't drive the oil pump if this doohickey's in the way. So we'll pull this guy out of the way. All right, and we shove this in the hole. And I, see, I forgot. Which way is it spin? Oh okay, yeah. So Derek, why don't you watch that oil pressure gauge for me? Nothing? Nothing. Oh, there it goes. I see it now. What do we got? Uh, about 80. 80 pounds? Yeah. Okay, we're good. All right. All right, so before I drop the distributor in, I want to make sure we're at top dead center compression on number one. So I'm, I pulled the number one spark plug out. Well, actually, Derek did and broke it. He so bashfully turned his head. All right, so I'm just going to stick my finger in the hole. I'm going to have Derek bump it over. And if it goes on my finger, 
and the uh, po the uh, balancer is at uh, zero. We're close to zero. That means we're number one compressor stroke. And I can plop the distributor in with the pointer aimed at number one. Plug wires, perfecto. Bump, bump. All right. So I don't know if you can see this or not, but see it's almost at top dead center and my finger went poof. So we'll plop it in right there. Okay. Plop this guy in there. Oh yeah, perfect. Numero uno. Got my plug wires all laid out, longest to shortest. Just need to cut them, strip them, crimp them, boot them, and then the plug wires will officially be done. If you notice, there's no coil on the engine because it is hiding behind the firewall. Anything I could have moved rearward, I did. All the plug wires are done, even my coil wire, and have moved on to throttling. I made this little guy here because anytime you have like a holly on there, the high rise, or even a semi high rise, the cable's never long enough. So I always have to lengthen it by like an inch and an eighth. Do you hear all that air noise over there? That's Derek getting the general ease tires ready. Got to put new rear tires on it because somehow they all balled it out. I don't know, it must be a tire problem. And what I am working on right now is exhaust. I want this thing to be like, what? Ah, ah. And we won't get that unless we have like the X pipe on there and side exhaust. So that's my plan. X pipage, loud mufflers, and full send. So what I have got here is just a cheapo X pipe kit from Summit, but it's actually a very nice X pipe kit. A lot of times on these X-Pipe kits from the Aftermark company, the center is not open enough to really make it effective, but these Summit kits are actually pretty nice. They did a mucho gooder job. So I'm going to semi-assemble this thing and then get it under the car to see how I need to attach it to the collectors. And the collectors, I have already tack welded V-band clamps on, did that last night. So, I'm going to get this thing attached. It's a little colder today, but this thing has to be done today. So I'm gonna finish welding up the exhaust. We need to break in the engine and we need to get the front end rolling. We don't need to make it functional. We should get the front end rolling because Willwood is hooking us up with a six piston disc brake setup on the super beater. Oh, big tires, big brakes, big engine, big exhaust and tiny steering wheel. This thing's going to be awesome. So, I got a lot to do today, and who knows when Mike will show up, you know. At least, you know, Mike showed up three days early before the event, and he did get his tack painted and bolted on, but I had to wire it up. I'm trying to think of what else Mike had done. I think he did something else, but I don't, it must not have been that important because I don't recall it. And then Daryl just had to show up with Porter mufflers because he was worried that I wouldn't get the car done in time. So he's over here working on the car. Only flew 3,000 miles just yep. to help you out. Yeah, he's like, I have to, the world has to hear the mufflers. So he's, you know, like, gotta get the car done. At least he's a hands on guy, even though he's, you know, a little too handsy at times, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, you figure you couple that with a Howard's cam, it's gonna like music of the people. Yeah, yeah, I'm waiting to hear that camshaft. Combined with that X-pipe and those mufflars. Yeah, we got 
Daryl's buddy right now, he's making the uh, floor patches because I'm still busy welding and doing other things. And so to make things go faster, more hands makes things go faster. So we're gonna go ahead and continue doing this and then we'll get you caught up as soon as we get a few more things done on the car. You know how to function those screwdrivers correctly? I know how to function those screwdrivers. I'm just trying to save this genuine Mopar. Oh, J-nut. Yeah. Yeah, did you know that was called a J-nut? I did know it was called a J-nut. Oh, okay, yes, yeah. look at that. So does metal shavings make the engine run better? It does. Oh, okay. It okay. absolutely does. Good, okay. All right, so Daryl got the hood pins installed. We just went ahead and removed the one bolt. And then, uh, so that one's good, that one's good. Whoa, dude, what? It's a freaking rare hood. It makes the rest of them that much more valuable. Yeah, but this is a non-air grabber Super B hood. So everybody else just thanked you on how valuable that the rest of them are gonna be. Well, when did you cut that? When you told me to cut it. I didn't tell you to cut this hood. Well, you already... It's already cut now. <laughs> We're committed. <laughs> you're, yeah, set. like you said, you're committed now. Go ahead and finish. Wait, wait, wait. So what are we doing again? We are just cut cutting that one liner. We're cutting this line right oh, here. Oh, it's for the hood clear. It's for the hood It'll right. be with quality and precision. Ish. You know, Mopar guys are just mother effing you right now. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. I'm okay. I'm still gonna sleep tonight. <laughs> well, hey. You might need this cross to protect you. You know that hood was off of my six pack car. Ready? That's a real six pack hood that you just messed up. Fine, I'm, I'm really already over it. He's like zero fucks given. Like, isn't the smoke supposed to go in the hood? The smoke is supposed to go out the exhaust. Yeah. It's, it's reversed right now. Is this a reverse rotation motor? The intake and then out? Come on, hit that hole. <laughs> I should be used to being able to hit a fucking big hole in a small unit. <laughs> <laughs> now he's got to fucking pour it all over <laughs> Well, that way when it catches on fire, it does it good. <laughs> nah, it's all good. Well, you don't need that. It's got uh, rear idlers. Yeah. It's not a, not a vacuum secondary, Gary. Well, you got to get it running first. <laughs> this will help it. Keep it running. <laughs> yeah, this, this would be how it is. I do 99.9% .9 of the work, and then everybody shows up to hear it fire up. <laughs> I just well, I, we just we just showed up because I thought you was probably already done. You are doing a great job. <laughs> you can pour water like nobody's business, right? Yeah, don't even shake. Yeah, steady hand. Really, me and Joe showed up so we could pick up parts off the ground. Oh, like <laughs> nope, Peckoff yeah, told me probably. Uh, yeah, oh Peckoff is. I thought you were just doing a really bad job of dumping the water in. <laughs> Why do those come open? <laughs> I'm getting out of the wood. It should be close to where it'll fire. Yeah, need to be a pair of gloves here ready to catch parts. <laughs> ready to battery on. Oops. Oh. on, yeah. on. Ready? Yep. Put some timing in it. That sounds good. All right, go ahead. Ready? Yep.
bad trip again. Did it? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I guess we should say why we shut it off. The uh, voltage regulator is not working, so it's spiking the, the uh, volt gauge. Oh, we know yeah. the alternator works. That's true. We do know the alternator works. Yeah, yeah, it'll be okay. <laughs> Apparently the there really is something wrong with the block. Even after I goobered and glued the crap out of that rear seal, it's leaking pretty good. And I'm really glad that by the time you guys see this, the car will have already run, so you can't bitch about it leaking on the track. <laughs> right? That's right. <laughs> so I'm making Mike actually do something to his car, so I'm having him put that block off or that, that shield in front of the balancer. Last no, time I was doing something, you were complaining because I was painting the tack and you said it wasn't important. I know, you could have been fixing that. <laughs> so while he's putting the cover on the uh, torque converter, okay. we're going to bullshit. Oh shit. Where's your fire extinguisher at? Oh shit. Grab the water. Where's the water? Right here. Oh, I said turn the oil in the headers. Yeah. Did you have the camera running? I did actually. Yeah, the headers caught on fire. Ah, uh, this thing is a runner. It sounds awesome. We've been spending the last couple hours just trying to button up all the little things. Like, we got our street signs in, which look amazing on the floorboard. We've got our fire extinguisher because, uh, you know, it did have a fire when we were breaking in the engine. So we were like, might need one of those. And uh, look, I got my ball joint drop brackets on there. So just getting all that together. And we're just going to put these junk rotors on it to get it to roll. Again, because Willwood is sponsoring us some badass brakes for this thing. Mike is working on his fancy uh, Joe Dirt throttle pedal. He's over there drilling the brackets for it right now. And I'm just going to go ahead and finish buttoning up this side on the suspension. Then we can put the rotors on it and get it on the ground, do an alignment on this thing. Oh, and I almost think this car's done. Besides rear hood pins, I think it's done. I think. <sighs> Lots of work on this thing. Slinging my brackets on. Yes, I designed these and had my buddy make them for me. So this will drop the ball joint an inch and a half. So that way it brings the bump stop away from the frame so you can lower the car and not have it bottom out on the bump and create a push situation. Plus, you will gain negative camber by dropping the ball joint and you will fix the roll center issues. The lower control will be level for a lowered car, which is what I want. Should handle awesome. First time the Super Beater has touched the ground. I, is this Super Beater 2.0? <laughs> oh, I gotta stand back and, and look at 26.0 at this point. 26.0, oh. I, I don't think the camera is gonna do justice on how cool this looks. Especially being confined in this tight spot, maybe when it gets out in the open. Except for you don't have the race car valve covers on it or the hood. Yeah, Mike's a. Uh, gluing the valve covers down and we're putting a breather on it to assist with the uh, oil leakage because these valve covers had no breathers on them so we're thinking maybe the addition of breathers will help slow the oil leak and hopefully but eliminate i need two, to do a two of the oil leaks yeah yeah i need to do a quick alignment on this thing so then we can get it ready to go on the trailer you know this thing's actually going to drop down more because we haven't even rolled it at all no all right alignment time once we get this thing under the scales, I'm betting that my bet is correct 
and Mike's is way under. He thinks this thing's gonna be like 2,700 pounds. There's no freaking way this car is just as light as the 71 RT. No freaking way. So, oh, I wanna see it. I said 2925 was my guess. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> so yes, earlier I said twenty nine twenty five. Twenty oh, look at dude, look at the cross weight. Oh wait, that's never mind. Gotta do the cross. 50.7, not bad at all. We don't have the hood on it yet. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. Well, then, wait, hold on. If we're gonna put the hood on it, if we're gonna put the hood on it, I guess I can take this off. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's probably gonna be right back where it was. <laughs> But we're still going to need to make the hood pin brackets and need uh, a few more uh, rivets. Oh wow, that hood's way heavier than I thought. I thought it'd be 40 pounds. 29.51. So That's you're 50 pounds. Yeah. Wow. What is your rear weight? Good thing I didn't bring the Super B emblem for the front of the hood. Holy hook. crap, dude, your rear weight is only 38%. That is bad. This is going to turn heads like no other at the track. I can't wait to see this thing actually on the ground and out in the open. All right, it's late. I think we're done, right? Well, we need Hood pin brackets. Well, it'll survive with just front pins on it. <laughs> well, it'd be nice to have it done. Because if it's raining in the morning, none of us are going to feel it. Yeah. Then we'll get right it off the scale. Oh, we'll, we'll, get it, we'll get it off the scales. We'll set the toe. And then we'll think about making your hood pin brackets. I was gonna do like a really cool intro, slow and all that stuff, but we're way behind. It's raining still, lightly, but the track is already open and we still need to get Willwood right brakes here, on the front of this thing. Right here, so we're just gonna go ahead and jump into it, but this thing is so badass looking. What do you think, Colton? You're good. <laughs> So we have camera guy Colton. <laughs> it's Mike's son, so he's gonna record us doing this because we don't have a whole lot of time. We gotta get this thing done. Okay, I thought I looked in there and said, that Mike Chris would run that thing and you know grease in there. Is that your uh, producer right there? Yeah. He's our new camera guy. Oh great, it's raining again. It did stop for like, what, 10 minutes? About 10 minutes. Yeah. So Chris, this is the norm to install Willwood brakes at muscle cars at the strip on the super beater? Well that's what they say in the instructions. Must be installed in the rain. Now I'm trying to figure out how we're gonna warm up. Oh Minty has a heater. That's right. Minty does have a heater. Minty has a heater. Five eight. 
to the load. Five days later. Five minutes later. So to narrate this scenario, update, still installing Woolwood brakes on the super beater. Well, they won't install themselves. Look at all that goodness right there. Yeah. yeah, and then stand back and look at what it's going on to. And we pan back. You know that's kind of how you do it? Well, even when we try and do that, we usually break it and then it'll have to There you go. My side's done. I don't know what Mike's doing over there. <laughs> hammering on shit. I know, I hear beating and hammering. Well, and yeah, the clip only went halfway in. <laughs> you know what I mean? The, the clip isn't in on this no, side. Didn't. Well, no, but it's not in on this it's side. It's good enough. All right. Yeah. All right, go ahead and finish your shit. Yes. That thing's a piece of shit. Do not buy a cheap eBay brake bias. It doesn't work. It's not allowing brake fluid past it. So we're kind of hosed on that. We need to get a union for that just so we can have rear brakes. And now we're going to move on to the front brakes so at least we can bed those in and maybe get some laps today and we'll fix the rears tomorrow. All right, it's been a long, cold, rainy day. We got the super beater good enough where we're going to take it for a test run. We actually had to put uh, spacers on the front wheels, but that's why we didn't have any spacers, so we had to just put a washer. So tomorrow we're going to get the correct wheel spacers, but today we just need to, the track is too court, too wet to, to go fast, so we're just going to kind of break the car in, just check it out. And then also, the Aspen is here. Both times I've wanted to take it out and beat on it out in the desert, the, uh, it was too windy. So I figured today, you know what, today's a good day to get it broke in and see if it's actually going to throw pistons out the exhaust like Gary says. So, uh, but yeah, we're just going to get this on the course. I'm just going to kind of do a rundown, Later. break it in. <laughs> break it <later. laughs> the cackle fest over there. All right, but yeah, I just want to break this car in, see what it's going to do. I have literally not driven this thing at all. So, Derek's tightening the wheels. Good job, Derek. Yeah, you might ought to set that, right? Here we go. Alright, here is the Super Beaver's debut. We got Mike Delson behind the wheel. I mean, he's okay, he's supposed to be taking it easy, but you know, whatever. Well, there, there's one cone, and, and this is at like half speed and hit cones already. Jesus, guys from North Dakota. North Dakota ain't paying for staying in the cones on wet pavement? Can this guy even stay in the lines in a coloring book? Why? Oh, man! It's embarrassing! Day two of mats. I'm getting buckled in this time to give it a shakedown while Mike is out running getting parts so I can see if this car is doing what it's supposed to do. Now, it still only has front brakes. We haven't fixed the rears yet, so I can't charge the corner like I really want to. So I'm just gonna kinda have to take it easy on corner entry and just see if the car will run and stay between the cones. But for my first 
first lap in the circuit, I was impressed on how well it handled, and I actually set fast time for most of the day till Huff finally beat it. Put a new wheel cylinder on the left rear. We actually got four wheel brakes now. And shiny wheels. Yeah. One. Shiny oh. goes fast. Right? Yeah. Wash the weight off of it. So now we're gonna watch Mike go pathetically slow in a fast car. You know controlled throttle is fast, right? Not as fun. I know, but it's you can hang this one out and still do controlled throttle. Yeah. Are you wiping that down with power strength or tranny fluid? Water. Oh. Just all of a sudden got shiny for always doling out now. I got car wax all those trips the car the Right. Haven't done a whole lot of filming because it's just been super swamp fixing cars. Uh should be good now though. rod kind of a worse situation but hopefully the camshaft is okay
super V. It is a real super V. He needs to get the big wings back on the back of it. Need that big wing. Maybe faster. Oh, yeah. Oh, nice. There we go. Save it.
up winning some trophies, just not exactly first place. Mike got second, but we did get the best beater award from Hemmings. So even Hemmings loved how beautiful this thing looked. It was a, it was a tall order to beat this thing though. I mean, Huff's got that much more meat, aluminum heads, more horsepower, shorter wheelbase. So Mike had his hands full, but yeah, he's not exactly an expert on cornering, so he'll get better with that. But this thing got all the looks it was awesome and it's another jalopy car that we got to bring out and compete with all our friends so the general ran and even the general got a third place today in time which the general is really fast for what it is it still surprises me how well that handles compared to huff's cheater car that somebody has now deemed the huff the magic dragon and another shocker was the Aspen. It ran really well. And somebody has deemed it Eileen number two because this is the initial, this is the original Eileen. This is Gary's car. I used to own this car. I, I gave this to Gary in only if he would bring it out here and run in the jalopy class. And he built it and he did. He's got big old meats on it this year. He put a sway bar, shocks on it. He ran really well with that. But the main thing, is that we were able to come out here and run our jalopy streetcars and just have fun with all of our friends. <laughs> so, next year, hopefully we can get the uh, super beater faster, get it to handle. Actually, this thing handled awesome. I drove this thing. This thing was fast. But it has a drag race spool in it. Drag race spools do not work on cornering. But even with all the detriments that it had, had smaller tires, so much nose weight, you know, the spool, we had to keep throwing lead inside the car, in the trunk, just to get it to hook up. But uh, still, super competitively fast and fun. And I would say it's the best looking jalopy car here. I love it. You know, John, maybe you might get a Hemmings Award if, it, if people could tell that it actually was a CUDA. Yeah, it doesn't really look much like right No, now. it has the gills, but it doesn't have fenders, doesn't have hood, doesn't have grill. How do you tell? Yeah. <laughs> but see, the super beater just trumps you because of the looks. It, it's, it's cuter. Yeah. No, what you gotta do is come back with a bigger spoiler. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you guys definitely got the big spoiler award. So. <laughs> but, I don't know. I had, I had fun. It's just another car that we're able to bring out here and just have fun with our friends. And it didn't really matter who won, who lost, except we, it is bragging rights. You know, Mike is going to have to hear it for the entire year. And he's going to have to pick it up next year. We have to hear it again. Uh, we let the young guy drive mine. So. Yeah. Oh. He shines. So it, it's, see the old man. He just has better reactions than the old guy. That's what happens. Oh no, yeah, Mike's getting old. Yeah. He's got to start throwing Colton in it. <laughs> all righty guys well i had a lot of fun building the super and i'm actually shocked that we got it done in time so we're gonna go ahead and load all this junk up and head home and then plan the next adventure so i'll see you guys then I'll just sit on the front end. Can I grab the front end? We're keeping it going? I'm down. Maybe I'm not. I can spin a tire while they're... Oh yeah, baby. <laughs>